Hi guys, Lyndon Poskett from Races to Places and this is Basil Bike. Now, as a follow on to my recent survey on Patreon.com, many people asked the second mo most popular request was we want to know more information about Basil Bike. Give us technical details about Basil Bike. You built the bike yourself, so I built the bike myself. Um, I know the bike inside out and I could probably talk about it for hours. Uh, I'm going to spend uh, well, a good few minutes walking through the bike with you uh, and sh talking a little bit about Basil Bike. So uh, we'll start with the base bike. The bike started as a 2007 KTM 690 Rally Factory replica. This was produced by the KTM uh, factory specifically for racing in the Dakar Rally and Cross Country Rally Series races. Um, now it often gets confused, a lot of people think that the 690 Enduro is very similar if not the same as this bike, but in actual fact it's a lot different and I'm going to talk through a lot of the differences with you, um, but basically I'm going to walk through the bike and tell you all about this bike. I'm not here to compare it to a production bike, it's not a production bike, it's a factory race bike that I've adapted myself for travel around the world. And the reason for that is because in races to places, I like to race and travel. So I like to travel to places and do races. And in order to do the races, you want the strongest, most reliable bike you can possibly get. So yeah, where to start? Let's um, start from the front of the bike and work my way to the back of the bike. So um, starting, let's just, well, let's just start with the wheels. Um, the wheels that I choose to use on my bikes are Woody's Wheel Works from the United States. That's where they're built. Um, they've got Woody's Wheels hubs. They use XL A60 rims. Now the reason that I use A60 rims is because they have, uh, they have a different shape to them which creates a much stronger rim. So you, they are much less susceptible to getting bends in the rims than a standard XL rim or another brand. Uh, they're the only rim that is shaped like this. They only come in narrow sizes, 1.6 front and 2.15 rear. So you have, you, you have to be careful with tire selection, but they are the strongest rims you can get. And coupled with them laced to the Woody's hubs with a Woody's super lace pattern, heavy duty stainless steel spokes and nipples. Um, they are the toughest wheel I've ever raced with and I stick with them all the time. You will notice, some people that follow me will know that I broke a wheel on my travels in Angola. That's just one of those things. It happens from time to time. Uh, it happened in Angola. I hit a huge lurker in the sand in fourth gear going pretty quick, quick and it was such a swear square sharp edge it snapped the rim around the spokes and uh, it was one of those things but testament to the wheels they lasted the duration about 2500 kilometers with a totally cracked rim uh, and the wheel stayed intact so big thumbs up to Woody's Wheel Works wheels and while we're on the subject of wheels let's talk about discs the discs that I use on my bike are Moto Master discs and they're the Moto Master factory rally spec discs oh. to go with the discs I use Brembo sintered pads. I find that these last the longest and offer the best performance in all round conditions. Um, so I use a Brembo sintered pad on a Motor Master disc. The discs have, offer very good grip and also a lot of feel and feedback through the lever, which is what I really like. So that's the brakes. The brake calipers are standard Brembo factory rally calipers and they're the calipers that you typically see on uh, production bikes also, nothing too special there. Uh, since we're moving on from the wheels, let's move on to the suspension on the bike. Um, it's, it's WP suspension, front and rear. Um, it's, the bike started out with a closed cartridge, twin, or twin chambers some people call them, rally forks, so it's these forks. Um, and I do do a little bit of work to them. Uh, the suspension on my bike now is prepared by Conflict Motorsports in the United States. And we have the upper tubes uh, Kashima coated and the lower fork tubes DLC coated. And this is to aid friction to allow the fork to slide better and reduce the amount of wear on the components inside. 
Obviously the bike is uh, a lot heavier than it was originally designed to be because I've got luggage on the bike and extra parts and components and everything. So the spring rate in the suspension is increased. So I run a much stiffer fork spring. I run a 5.4 fork spring. Uh, standard is about a 4.8. Um, and the rear shock spring, when I'm racing, I use a 92. And when I'm traveling, I use a 120. Much stronger rear spring, because with all the luggage, I need a strong spring on there. Internal-wise of the suspension, few modifications, just to my own liking in terms of valving, etc. But other than that, pretty much standard, uh, but just the coatings and internal changes. One key thing I'd like to mention is the fork savers that I use, the neoprene fork savers on the fork. Um, I didn't use these at the start of my trip and the problem is when you're riding in all weather conditions, as soon as you go through some mud and the mud gets on the lower fork stanchion, if then you leave your bike and the, dry, the mud dries, you come back to your bike, you ride over a big jump, the suspension compresses fully and the mud, the dried mud gets pushed all the way into your seals and inside your fork it dirties your oil and it causes havoc with your seals and you're forever cleaning seals and I needed a solution. I tried some shorty seal savers which just sit over the top, didn't work, uh, the same and then I decided to go with a thin full length neoprene fork saver which we actually make ourselves and uh, since I've done that the mud lands on the fork saver uh, it dries on there and then when you compress the fork it just breaks off and disappears and the actual lower stanchion is kept clean the whole time and that's really essential for keeping the fork maintenance to a minimum and the longevity that the seals last to a maximum as possible. Uh, this current set that's in the bike now has done 30,000 kilometers and I haven't touched the seals, I haven't even had to clean them, no leakages, nothing fork still working great. It's getting ready for a service for sure, but I don't have any maintenance issues on the road. Move on to the shock then. Um, the shock sits inside here. Uh, I use a standard factory rally bike shock for uh, races to places on Basel bike. Um, this is very different to the 690 Enduro setup. Um, it's a longer shock which gives full 320 millimeters of travel suspension. So. Uh, on this bike we've got 320mm on the front and 320mm on the rear. Now to make that possible the frame has to be different. So the frame of the bike is considerably different and we'll come on to the frame in a moment. It's a rising rate linkage system so the suspension linkage on the bike um, provides a rising rate for the shock. Uh, I've already talked about the spring rate and we do additional modifications inside the shock uh, to help handle the bike handle better with the heavy weight and luggage that we've got on there. We also use a remote preload adjuster so that when I've not got luggage on I can back the preload up on the rear shock uh, from the outside without having to remove the shock. That's a key thing to do. Um, and on the suspension linkage on this bike uh, the swing arm and linkage that the bike uses is different to a production bike. It's got a much stronger swing arm um, even though I've managed to break one in the Kalahari Rally uh, in 2018. It's got a much stronger swing arm uh, than a production bike and also the pins on the suspension linkage system are much bigger diameter and stronger. So the whole setup is much stronger and that's, that really lends itself uh, to carrying the additional weight as well and still being able to ride off-road like I like to ride. The linkage on this bike is an LPR greasable linkage. That means that it's been fully modified, the whole setup, so that grease can be pumped into it from a grease gun. And this is essential because it's really difficult to get to. So to take it out, to grease it, um, and then put it back in, it's a big job. You have to take a lot of the bike apart to do it. So it's a greasable linkage. We just go underneath, pump grease in, uh, do that probably once a month, something like that. If I've been going through a lot of river crossings, do it more often, but you just find a place that has a grease gun and pump some grease in there. It pushes any, any water or anything that's in there out, keeps it fully packed. And for me, that's the difference between a linkage lasting 20,000 kilometers and a linkage lasting 100,000 kilometers. And that's what I get out of the last one. Um, so that's it really with the suspension system on the bike. The last thing to say about the suspension, uh, attached to the suspension at, at the front is a set of billet triple clamps 
that are adjustable offset. So they offer me 20 or 22 millimeter offset, depending whether I'm doing tight twisted tracks or long sandy fast conditions. Now obviously on races to places I don't adjust it, um, I just leave it in the set position. Uh, but if I was racing the bike and we knew we had some different conditions you could adjust it but on races to places it just stays in the standard position uh, and it's very very good it's attached to a built-in um, Scott's Olin steering damper uh, and that I can adjust on the fly just by reaching it in the front there so that's the suspension system I was on the bike now I'll go on to the chassis because I talked about um, the frame being somewhat different to production bikes. Because the shock is longer, um, the upper attachment on the bike is different. It also is not a cast unit. On the production bikes, production 690s, the upper shock mount is cast um, and it offers a bit, a, little bit, a little bit more flex in the frame. So the, the upper shock mount is much stronger on the 690 Rally on this bike and it's also repositioned higher so you can fit a longer shock in there. Um, so that's one of the main differences on the frame. Now in, before I build these bikes I make other modifications to the frame. There's a couple of areas that are not necessarily weak spots but areas of, uh, that when we put luggage on for example puts additional load. So if we talk about the upper rear tank mount that takes in a lot more load than it was originally designed for, so that's strengthened and stiffened. There's a couple of uh, fillets and plates and put elsewhere on the frame where I know there's weak places from previous experiences racing these bikes. They're all stiffened up around the yoke, midpoints, um, engine hanger positions, etc. So a lot of people don't realise the um, additional strength and features that went into actually building this bike for long distance off-road, hardcore adventure riding that we put it through. Um, but that happened at the very beginning when I built the bike. So that's a bit about the frame. Um, let's talk next, working from the front still, about the navigation tower. Now, people that are not familiar with navigation towers and rally bikes, the reason to have a navigation tower up here is so you don't have to keep looking down at the, at the center of the bike for, to see where you're going. It's important to have the, the instrument panel as high as possible so that when you're riding the bike, you, you're, look, you're still looking where you're going when you glance down. You can see in your peripheral vision what's up front. And that's for your safety. So we want the things as close up top as possible um, on the navigation tower. So the navigation tower on this bike attaches, it's actually welded, a welded bracket to the frame, that's for ultimate strength. It then mounts onto two aluminium brackets to two side plates which then mounts all the equipment up at the top here where you can see it nice and easily when you're riding. So on the navigation tower we have a road book. This is what we use to uh, install the roadbook instructions for a rally um, and we control it from a control unit on the handlebar which I'll come on to. Um, but it rolls forward, it rolls backwards and it gives you the information when you're navigating by a roadbook where you are going. We then have two trip computers, a primary and a secondary and also a compass heading uh, repeater. So we have a compass uh, unit which tells us it's a digital compass, tells us where we're going. This is the one on the right hand side here. Uh, and then there's various rally units and devices that different rallies use. Uh, I like to ride with a rally comp which they use in some uh, rallies in the United States because it has other features like you can load waypoints into it and such like that. So that's what I have on Basel bike. I don't use the road book when I'm traveling but I leave it on there because when I come to a rally I've got it with me and obviously I don't go home much in between so I just want to have all the equipment with me on the bike. So. Let's move on quickly to the controls for the uh, navigation tower. Everything is controlled from the handlebars. Um, so all the controls for the trip computers, for the scrolling of the roadbook, for the uh, rally comp, it's all controlled from the handlebars. So I don't need to remove my hands from the handlebars when you're riding. Because when you're riding fast, off-road, in technical terrain, the most important thing is to keep your hands on the handlebars. Something that I can't do at the moment with a broken hand. Um, so that's the control. 
For the controls, we use an integrated Linden Posket Racing control switch. Um, it's a rally adventure switch we use, which controls two units and the road book. And it also houses the light switch and the CEV standard light switch and the rocker switch for the turn signals. So it's all in one place, everything controlled from one side. Therefore, you can concentrate your throttle hand on other things. You don't need to worry about switch gears on that side. So everything's controlled from the left side of the handlebar. While we're on the handlebars, um, we'll just talk about the handlebars quickly. Cycra Probend Pro handguards, believe it or not, these are the same ones I've had for 220,000 kilometers on races to places. Uh, I just straighten them if they get bent, but they protect the levers. I've not had one broken lever on races to places, so it's a testimony to the Cycra Probend bars. Really important to install them properly so they don't flash on things when you turn the handlebars and such, um, but really do recommend them and I run them on all my bikes. So moving on to the uh, GPS, um, the GPS and the GPS receivers and um, electronic equipment I like to keep in the centre of the handlebars. The reason for this is because the handlebars in an accident protect everything in the middle here. This is probably one of the safest places on the bike, so I run my Garmin GPS in there. Uh, or the GPS device that they use on various rallies always get housed in the middle. It's expensive equipment and you don't want to break it or be without it. So I host the GPS in the centre there. The only downside is you have to look down a bit further and you don't you lose a bit of the peripheral vision riding forward. So it would be safer up here, but with all my navigation system up here, I like to keep it just safe in the centre of the handlebars there. So that's it for the handlebars. Uh, we've also got double take mirrors from the United States. Um, I really like these because you can adjust them easily. Um, you, can, you can fold them into the center of the bike. If you crash, they just fold out of the way. Um, so really, really solid and robust mirror from doubletakemirror.com. The grips are, they are Pro Grip 714 Rally Grips. They're a rubber grip. I prefer these to foam grips because they offer just the same vibration resistance but they don't absorb moisture as well um, and they last forever. I've, had them, I've, I've done over 100,000 kilometers on one set of these rally grips um, so I really love these Pro Grip 714 rally grips. So having covered the navigation tower and the handlebars and controls there, um, let's just talk about the front fairing on the bike. Um, the front fairing is a carbon composite fairing, um, it's very lightweight and it really is just to offer some aesthetics to the bike, uh, a little bit of uh, wind direction for the cooling of the bike and the air intake uh, and also offers a clear protection for the headlights, which if we move on to the headlights on the bike, um, the one headlight is just a standard Heller headlight unit with a HID bulb in it. Um, so we use a standard HID and that's just for regular driving and driving on the road so other road users can see you. Can't really see that much with it at night, it's not very great for riding at night. Uh, but when you're riding off-road at night or you want to really light things up, we have a Baja, Baja Design Squadron LED light uh, in the second slot and that's mounted with an LPR bracket onto the factory rally nav tower. Um, so really you've got best of options covered with the headlight, you've got a standard stroke, relatively low right, safe for oncoming vehicles, light, then you've got a blind everything, see everything um, LED light at the bottom there. Um, so that's the light setup and the fairing. Uh, just quickly touch base on the fender situation. Uh, I know a lot of people ask me, uh, why don't you run a low fender? Well, I do sometimes run a low fender, especially on the Dakar Rally, um, but one of the main reasons not to run a low fender is that they collect mud. Uh, and if you're in very claggy clay mud, uh, the mud gets stuck underneath the fender and it can actually be ripped off. And now, because the front brake line attaches to it, that can be quite dangerous. Uh, and it can also stop the wheel, front wheel turning. So the newer, the later fenders are very good. They don't get clogged up as easily, um, but to be honest, for longevity and strength uh, and everything, I just prefer this high fender setup. Um, the thing with the high fender setup is it's very strong residual, crash it well. Um, the lower fork guard, forks are protected with these plastic fork guards, uh, and 
there's nothing really else to worry about. It never breaks, it never fails, it lasts a long time. The only thing I would say is that the uh, you need to make sure that your front fender has some uh, ventilation in the back, which these factory rally fenders do, just to help the airflow through the radiator. Um, which brings us on to the radiator. Uh, let's talk a little bit about the radiator on the bike. It's, uh, it's a larger volume and it also has a bigger core than a production bike radiator. It's a one piece curved radiator uh, which just fits uh, behind the fairing here. Um, so the engine's liquid cooled. And then we have a Linden Poskett Racing Pro Seal guard uh, between the radiator guard and the bash plate. Now the reason for this is to stop, it's twofold really, it's to stop mud and rocks and everything uh, getting in and clagging up around your exhaust header pipe and your engine and it's also to stop grass and shrubbery and every, anything that can burn getting in there and trapped around your exhaust because the last thing we want to do is burn our bike to the ground. So the Pro Seal, LPR Pro Seal guard is really important between the radiator and the bash plate. So as well as having a radiator and liquid cooled engine, um, this bike's also oil cooled. There's an oil cooler here under the front of the fairing uh, to cool the oil in the engine. And that's really important for like long distance, high, um, high demand conditions in very, very hot temperatures. For example, crossing deserts. You know, crossing Australia, when I crossed Australia, super, super hot temperatures. So the oil cooler just helps to keep the oil temperature down in extreme environments like that. So an oil cooler, something that production bikes typically don't have. The factory rally bikes have a carbon bash plate. Uh, and what we, what we don't like about that, especially on adventure travel, we do like that it's lightweight. But on adventure travel that I do, I bash the bash plate a lot in rocky riverbeds and such and it just gets smashed to pieces. Uh, and after changing two on races to places, I decided to design my own Linden Poskett Racing aluminium bash plate. It's strong, it's got a five millimeter base, four millimeter sides, and then some two one litre tool compartments which are watertight inside. Um, and that just helps uh, give a little bit of storage space. And also we've got this super strong bash plate which protects the exhaust system on the bike because it runs under the engine and also obviously the bottom of the engine. So Linden Poskett Racing aluminium bash plate. Uh, and these are available for the 450 rallies, available for the 690 factory rally replicas uh, with no toolboxes, single toolbox or twin toolboxes inside them. So that's the bash plate. So since we're in this area, uh, let's talk a little bit about the footrests on the bike. The footrests are wider and uh, they're wider to offer a better purchase for your foot. Um, they're a factory rally foot peg, uh, typically about an inch and a half wider than a normal off-road bike foot peg. Uh, and these are the same foot pegs that I've had on the bike since the very beginning. Um, they're very strong, they crash well, they fold apart of the way, um, no problems at all. Now, one of the significant modifications that you see um, that you see on this bike is the uh, luggage rack that we've got on the back of the bike. Now, in order to make the luggage rack fit, so it's a Linden Poskett Racing luggage rack, it's designed specifically to fit around the twin exhaust systems on my bike here. Um, it needs to attach down here. The reason for that is it takes a lot of the load. If you just put luggage on the fuel tank, all the load goes through the fuel tank. So by having the luggage rack, you transfer the load down through the footrest hangers through the swing arm pivot and into the chassis. Um, and that's a much more, much stronger and reliable system to house the luggage. So at the top it attaches onto the, the tank uh, with four M8 fasteners um, uh, and at the bottom it attaches onto the footrest hangers. Uh, and uh, it's a custom uh, luggage rack as I said. Uh, we do have rear footrest brackets, footrests here. Uh, very rarely had to use them on races to places, but you never know when you might want to pick up a chick. I mean, sorry, you might want to pick up a local and find out where some fuel is or something like that. Uh, so we have some footrests on there just in case. Uh, then we've got a luggage plate on top, which we can mount like a uh, top bag on or just to keep the weight off the plastic fender underneath. And that's pretty much it. Uh, that's the luggage rack. So 
Let's talk about the fuel setup on the bike and the fuel systems. So the fuel tanks we've got on the bike, there's three fuel tanks. There's a rear fuel tank, which is a nylon structural member. It's attached here and it runs all the way to the back and the filler neck is at the top here. It's 16.8 litres. Um, so 16.8 litres in the rear of the bike. Then we've got two seven and a half stroke eight litre saddle tanks at the front, one on the right, one on the left with almost well, 60% of each fuel tank being at the very bottom down here. And that's to keep the weight low and forwards. So on the rear tank, the majority of the fuel is low and forwards, and on the front tanks, it's low and forwards. And that helps keep the CFG down. You don't have all the fuel up here. Um, and because it's such a tall bike, uh, keeping the fuel as low as possible is very important. Um, so there's the fuel tanks, uh, nylon rear, um, uh, and these from plastic tanks also. Um, while we're on the fuel system, let's talk about the fuel delivery system. This bike, uh, Basel bike, runs on a carburetor. Now some of you might be thinking that's old school. Well, I chose it to be that way. I wanted to run the bike on a carburetor because in the remote system, places that I travel, I want to be able to fix any fuel related system problems I have. Uh, and I can do that with a carburetor. With a fuel injection system it's much more complicated. You need a computer to diagnose problems with the bike. There's lots more electronics and sensors on the bike. There's an ECU to control the fuel delivery system, to, to control the fuel delivery. Um, and I don't have that on this bike. It's a simple wiring loom with decent grade wire that I can investigate with a multimeter if I have a problem. It's a simple wiring loom. I can look at the wiring loom and see what's going on with everything on the bike. So if I have a wiring problem, it's easy to fix. So that's really important as well. The wiring loom is much different to a production bike with EFI. Um, the carburetor is an FCR 41 mm flat slide carburetor uh, produced by Kine. It's very well used in many bikes all over the world. It's been around for years. It's reliable. Uh, I carry a rebuild kit with me, but I have to say I haven't had to repair. I haven't had one fuel delivery related problem on Basel bike since I began 200,000 kilometers ago, five years ago. So the simplicity of the fuel delivery system is very important, and that's what we've got on this bike. Very simple carburetor. Uh, bike um, and it works absolutely perfectly. Um, we have a big filter leading into the carburetor just to prevent any debris or anything coming through the fuel system getting into the carburetor but at least a carburetor can take a little bit more dirt and debris than a fuel injection system can. So uh, we don't need a laptop, we don't need to carry sensors and spare parts and uh, fuel pumps also for fuel EFI bike you need fuel high pressure fuel pumps we don't need any of that we just run a simple Mikuni vacuum operated fuel pump and that delivers the uh, fuel to the carburetor and in fact if my fuel pump breaks I can just bypass it pressurize the tanks through these hoses and the carburetor receives fuel very simple systems work really well so since we've just talked about carburetor, let's move on to talking about the engine on the bike. Um, here. So the engine on the bike uh, is a Linden Poskett Racing 732cc KTM LC4 engine. Uh, and lots of parts inside the engine have changed. So while it looks like a standard LC4 from the outside, it's actually far from it. I'm just going to talk through some of the changes on the engine. First of all with the engine, uh, the engine we've actually got a, a 732cc. This bike started out life as a 654cc, so we've got a longer stroke crank, we've got a larger cylinder, we've got a different piston in there. Um, so the whole engine is different, the crank, the cylinder and the piston. Um, and to go with that, you know, it's not just increasing the uh, size of the engine, we also have a significantly improved camshaft. So we run a high lift long duration camshaft to optimize the performance from the engine. Uh, and to give you an idea, the standard engine was running about, uh, from memory, about 60, 65 horsepower at the rear wheel. And we're now getting close to 80 out of this one. So. Um, we've got a lot, lot more performance now 
uh, and it's taken me some years to develop that but uh, we've got a really solid engine now. I've been using it for this particular 732 I've been using for 140,000 kilometers um, and we've not had any engine related issues uh, but it's, it's all one unit. The piston, crankshaft and camshaft is all designed to work together and it's all machined to fit together just so. Um, it's very important that the piston is designed to work with the high lift camshaft. So, um, lots of uh, changes to the engine uh, to make it the performance we've got today. And a lot of people say, well, you increase the top end performance, you lose the torque at the bottom end. That's not so. We worked really hard to get the crossover right on the camshaft and also the size of the engine correct so that we maintained that low end torque uh, that's so good on these single cylinder engines. Um, so that's the engine. Um, I've talked about the cooling system already with the bigger radiator, so that just goes in line with the engine. Uh, and let's talk about the transmission. Transmission and clutch inside the engine is very different too. We've got a Nova Racing uh, wide ratio gearbox, which I worked closely with Nova to develop over the past few years to optimize it to get the best solution. And the, the, the version C that I'm running in this bike now is available to the public. And what does it offer to you? Well, the standard gearbox has lots of false neutrals, what we call false neutrals, where you go for a gear and you miss it, it's not there. And this is due to the dog phasing in the gearbox. So we fixed all the dog phasing. We, we optimized the dog phasing on the gear changes. We put different back cuts on some of the dogs to make it uh, engage more positively. Uh, it's a much slicker gear, gear change. Um, we also changed the shafts. There's been some problems in the early engines with broken output shafts uh, on the engines. So we changed the shafts to prevent that. We've got stronger materials and better finishes on the shafts. Uh, and all the gear ratios are changed apart from second gear. So every gear inside the gearbox is new. We've got a lower first gear, which helps for in technical situations and very slow situations with a heavy bike, especially when you're carrying luggage. It makes it much easier uh, to ride in the slow conditions. And then we've got a longer, taller sixth gear and evenly spaced gears in between. So I can cruise happily um, on the highway at 100 miles per hour if I wanted to on this bike without over revving the engine. And that's really important, that's one of the things for me, I wanted to be able to cruise at 80 miles per hour comfortably uh, and I wanted to be able to do slow and technical stuff also. And with the production gearboxes they're typically a closer ratio together and it's just not possible. You end up changing the final drive ratio uh, to achieve what you want at slow speeds but then you can't go on the highway and vice versa. You don't have that with this gearbox, it's good at low speeds and it's good at the high speeds as well. Now, connected to the gearbox um, is a custom billet clutch with more plates in it. The standard clutch, when you start to increase the horsepower of the engine, um, obviously it puts more pressure on the standard clutch. And also the standard clutch is a torque locking slipper mechanism. It's a complex clutch. It requires on slip inside the system uh, to allow it to work. It pulls the pack together um, and it's just it's just not as strong as the clutch that we use in this engine. So uh, we, it's got the standard clutch has four springs uh, and the torque locking mechanism. This is a straight clutch with six springs and it's got more plates inside it so it's much stronger. Now to accompany that, you, it's just more reliable. To, to accompany the um, clutch we need a bigger volume cover. So we've got a custom two piece LPR cover on here um, which, which also allows you to get easy access to the clutch via this external uh, removable access panel. On the standard production bags you have to remove the luggage rack and the footrest and everything to get to the clutch because the, it's a one piece clutch cover. When we designed this clutch cover we, we came up with a removable clutch, clutch cover system like on the factory bikes so you can access the clutch plates should you need to change the clutch plates. Uh, which I did have to do in the Kalahari Rally in 2018 and it's very easy to do. Uh, with the standard clutch cover you have to remove the luggage rack, the footrest hangers because the one piece clutch cover goes behind it. So it's much easier uh, from a maintenance point of view with this new cover and you can also have a custom cover on it if you so wish. Uh, one last thing just on the gearbox, it's shot peened and super finished which offers lower friction and slicker changes. So it's, uh, 
it's a really nice finished gearbox. So that's it on the engine. Um, the engine in this bike has been a 732 for about 140,000 kilometers now. So lots of testing and experience on it. And uh, we've got engines now built all over the world. We have uh, engines racing, road racing, supermoto, sidecar racing, enduro racing, rally racing, and long distance adventure riding like I do on Baselbike here. The engine that I use in Baselbike is a mid-level tune so it's basic it's not the highest end tune because we don't want all top end performance we want to maintain some of the mid-range and the bottom end as well um, but it's far far better than the stock engine that comes in the production 690 um, uh, basically though the engine the the only things that are standard in the engine is the crankcases the cylinder head and the bearings and various bits and pieces inside the engine the main components crank cylinder piston camshaft, gearbox and clutch are all changed for Linden Poskett racing parts. So let's just talk about the exhaust system on Basel bike. It's quite a bit different to a conventional bike exhaust system. The first things that people normally see is that it's an underslung exhaust system, meaning that the exhaust header pipe goes underneath the engine and then it upsweeps towards the back and exits at the rear and also it exits in two places so it's a one into two exhaust system so single cylinder exiting at two places um, the reason for the underslung nature of the pipe at the front is because of the front fuel tanks they take up the space where a conventional exhaust system would typically go and also we want to remove as much heat from the exhaust header pipes as possible from being close to the front fuel tanks so the safety, safest thing to do and the only place we've got space to do it is to route the header pipes all the way underneath the bike instead of through where the front fuel tanks are. Uh, it allows us to keep the weight of the front fuel tanks low and keep the heat away from the front fuel tanks. Now why does it upsweep towards the back and have such high level outlets? Well that's to keep the outlets of the exhaust level with the air intake on the bike because if you end up pushing your bike through deep water uh, and the engine's not running, not only don't you get it in your air intake if you keep the level below the air intake inlet, but if your exhaust system's at the same level, you're not gonna get water down your exhaust system. So that's the main reason for having them so high at the back. Um, you'll see this too, there's a couple of reasons for this. The first reason for there being twin exhaust system is performance and breathability of the exhaust system. It's a big, high performance single cylinder engine and the factory I'm sure did lots of testing on this. Um, but to get the best performance out of it, you get that with this twin exhaust system. And also coupled with that, to keep noise levels down, it's easier with a twin exhaust system than it is with a single. That said, I choose to run without the DB killers straight through exhaust silencers and it sounds glorious. The silencers that I use on uh, my bike uh, are Krapovich exhaust systems from Slovenia. Uh, super good quality, titanium silencers, lightweight, less than half the weight of the production silencer that comes on these bikes and the silencers that we're used to seeing on production bikes. Very good quality and very long lasting. These have been on the bike for tens of thousands of kilometers and I've not had to take them off and repack them yet. So that's a little bit about the exhaust system on Basel bike. Let's move on to the drivetrain on the bike. Um, lots of people ask me what the final drive ratio that I use, front and rear sprocket. Obviously that's relative to the um, gearbox that I've got in the bike because I don't have a production gearbox so it's got different ratios. I actually use a 1749 is what I've got on the bike currently. Um, I use a standard KTM front sprocket um, and I use a DID chain. Now it's really important to use a high quality chain especially if you're traveling long distances and you want to get the most from your chain and also to maintain it well. If you want to know how to maintain the chain properly, please check out my Motorcycle Maintenance Essentials with Motorex where I talk about how to clean and lubricate your chain properly to get the most from it. Um, so a DID chain, KTM front sprocket and then we use a DDC Racing rear sprocket. Now that's something pretty special. It's a super hard, long lasting rear sprocket and actually I only need to change the rear sprocket every three chains and front sprockets. It's so tough. 
You get a year's guarantee with these things and even on races to places, I have not managed to call on that guarantee. Super tough rear sprockets from DDC Racing in the United States and the, the thing is, you only need to carry then a front sprocket. You don't need to worry about being able to get a rear sprocket from anywhere, carry a front sprocket and you can always find uh, good quality chains around the world. So we've always managed to find a good chain at motorcycle shops all around the world. So that's my final drive. And I think uh, just about lastly, um, seat. The seat I use on this bike, as you can see, is very big. Now for me that's fine because I've got a tall inseam. Uh, it's a Renasco racing seat, also from the USA. I've been using these seats since 2007 on my, on my race rally and adventure bikes and I absolutely swear by them. Super comfortable, reshaped for the best comfort for whether you're racing or adventure riding. Um, it's a suede design, suede cover for extra comfort. I have mine personally embroidered uh, and you can have yours custom done too by uh, Renasco Racing. Um, but yeah, that's the seat that I use. Because it's suede, it obviously takes in moisture when it rains, so I just carry a simple lightweight rain cover in one of my panniers. Um, but yeah, that's what I use on all my bikes, Renasco Racing, uh, custom seats designed and you know, I've developed my seat shape and what I like over the past few years with them, uh, but I'm super happy with them and I'll be continuing to use them. So I think that's it. That uh, should give you a good overview, a detailed overview of, of Basil Bike and how he's different to most production bikes. He really is a thoroughbred race bike converted to be used in adventure riding conditions. I can ride this bike around the world, I've proved that, and I can also race top level cross country rallies on it. It really is the most versatile adventure bike that I've ridden and that's why I built it, because I wanted a bike capable of doing round the world adventures and rally racing and that's what we've got here in Basel Bike. The main thing is though, be happy with your choice of bike. This might not suit you, it might not be your riding style. The most important thing is to buy a bike or you know, work on a bike and build a bike into what you want for what you want to do with it. I did that for me with Basel Bike, you do that with your own and enjoy your riding. And if you enjoy what you do, if you get it right, and you will enjoy what you do just like I do. Uh, and you'll enjoy it much more. If you've got the bike that's suited for your needs, you're gonna enjoy it, so that's all you need to do. Buy a bike or build a bike that's suitable for your needs and how you like to ride, go out and enjoy it. So that's it, uh, that's a review of Basel Bike on Basis to Places.